Welcome to the Amateur Family Archivist. This is part one of a three-part series explaining a system for cataloging and preserving a large collection of family documents and images. I will show how to use simple lists and off-the-shelf materials to place your documents and images in a logical order so you can search for and retrieve a record with some basic information. You can also use the cataloging system to save your documents to a server or a personal cloud. Part two of this series will explain how the system archives and preserves paper documents. Part three will explain how to archive and preserve images. This part explains the logic of the system. As your library expands, you must rely on a logical structure to find a document or image, check it out of your personal library, and return it to the place where it can be found again. The first principle of the system is a numbering convention to give each piece of paper and image a unique identifier. So let's go over the numbering convention for documents. Begin with a unique identifier, a letter abbreviation representing the author followed by a date that you assign to the document in order of year, month, and day. For example, a letter by Eula Tharp Smith dated December 19, 1945 could be coded as ETS 1944.12 dot one nine. Suffixes can be added to prevent duplication of numbers. Multiple documents by the same author on the same day can have an extension 0 .01, 0 .02, etc. Example, three letters by Eula Tharp Smith dated December 19, 1944 would be coded ETS 1944.12.19, ETS 1944.12.19.01.02, and so on. Identify each piece of paper with an extension, such as ENV for envelope, PG1 for page 1, PG2 for page 2 and make sure you list the authors and their abbreviations somewhere and check it routinely. Envelopes and pages in Excel will look like this using the previous example with the column for author and for the number that follows. The first letter is an envelope and one piece of paper. The second letter is an envelope and two pieces of paper. And the third letter on that same day is a piece of paper without an envelope. So here is your order of operations for documents. Open Excel, check for duplicates, and assign a number. Scan all pieces of paper into one PDF file. Place each item in a protective sleeve and label the sleeve by the appropriate extension. List each piece of paper in Excel and place the sleeves in a binder in order by author or date, for example. This series explains the numbering convention for images. Images have several characteristics such as subject, who is in the picture, an event, what was happening when the picture was taken, and a date, when was the picture taken, and location, where were the subjects? An identifier cannot convey all characteristics of an image, so I number each image consecutively as I find it, using an Excel list divided into columns by number, location, and description. I assign a letter prefix to the number to identify the person or organization that collected the image. This might give me a clue as to who the subject or location was in the image. Listing images in Excel by number, location, and description will look like this. Your description will contain any information that you can add that will be interesting to you or any reader. In this last one, I have a different folio number, and I recommend that each folio have its separate 
worksheet in your Excel workbook. Some recommendations. Identify each person in Excel by full name, including maiden name, if known. Avoid using father, mother, or the like. Identify unknown images or subjects as unidentified. I use this to help my search function and find unidentified images that I can review with family members. Save each image to the digital library by the number you assigned. This is the order of operations for images. Open Excel and assign the next available number in the folio. Scan and save the image to the digital library by the assigned number. Enter the information about the image into Excel. Place photos and negatives into protective sleeves and label each according to the number. Finally, place sleeves into binders. Using this system, I have compiled volumes of documents and images. The question remains as to how to use the system to further my family research. I frequently post documents and images to genealogical websites and social media such as Flickr, followed by a citation to the unique identifier that I use in my library. The citation helps me to know where to find the physical or digital item in my library. Another way to use the system is to track issues in your family history with note cards. An issue is something I think is interesting. It can be an event or a line of inquiry. For example, I visited the National Archives in College Park, Maryland to see what I could learn about my father's service in Korea after the end of World War II. A gentleman said I couldn't learn much without knowing the number of his military unit. I plan to return with something like this, uh, an index card under his army unit as the issue. Under the title is a list of two documents that contain his unit identification and a photograph of the shoulder patch that he wore. I will have copies of these items on my computer to show in case the National Archives needs more specific information. I will file the card away for future reference. I can create additional cards for other issues such as employment, residence, spouse, etc. with a list of images and documents that mention them. This concludes part one of the Amateur Family Archivist. I found the system to be straightforward and workable. On a number of occasions, I have been rewarded for following every step of the process. Thank you for your service to your family and to history. And remember, have fun along the way.